Today is August the 14th, 2007, and I'm at the OSU Tulsa Library uh, to speak with Penny Williams, who was in the House of the Re House of Representatives, was elected to the House of Representatives in 1980 and right. served through 1988, at which time she was elected to the Senate and served through 2004. Right. And uh, left because of term limits. And this is part of the Oklahoma State University Library's oral history project entitled Women of the Oklahoma Legislature. So thank you so much for talking with me today. Happy to. Okay. Our first uh, a little bit of information to take care of is tell us a little bit about your childhood, where you were born, and how you came to be in Oklahoma. Well, by a circuitous route. <laughs> I was born in New York City in the doctor's hospital in 1937, and then, in the middle of the war, my mother and father were divorced. So I lived back and forth between uh, Long Island and New York City, and grew up with dogs. <laughs> and so that heavy panning in the background... Is Blackie. Is Blackie and not me. <laughs> At any rate, uh, Grew up, spent a lot of time with my grandmother in New York City, and then by the end of the war, my mother had remarried, and we moved to North Carolina and California. We, my stepfather was in the Marine Corps, so we moved that way. But we finally came to settle in Camden, South Carolina. And the reason we settled in Camden, South Carolina, is that we could not settle in Aiken, South Carolina, because my mother thought, or was told, that Aiken was not large enough to hold both my mother and my stepfather's immediate ex-wife. <laughs> and uh, she, she had become a real horsewoman because of my grandmother's divorce, which was the first of its kind in New York. And um, so my two, my mother and my aunt were kicked out of the school, the girls' school that their grandfather had helped start. Because he was of a co-founder. And they were kicked out of the school because uh, my grandmother divorced. And she had five children, and that was just unheard of in those days. And so my two, so the two girls were shipped off to boarding school in Aiken, South Carolina. And my mother always said that was the making of her life because she fell in love with horses and riding, and um, just became the passion of her life. And she rode for lots of different people. She was in the first ladies' race, and so I grew up with this woman and her scrapbook. <laughs> And that was probably the most romantic thing in my childhood, was that scrapbook of all these pictures of her in the newspapers all over the place. But it was a great growing up. We grew up in Camden, South Carolina. I went to school there as a um, kind of a, like a something between a very small rural school and home school. Because we finally uh, left the public system and went to a Calvert system that was used by the missionaries who were going to Africa. This is out of Baltimore, Maryland. And it was a wonderful system, and uh, it was a small school that adopted this system. And so we all went to this school, those of us who lived in my neighborhood. So we walked to school, and it was just, it was really a wonderful growing up with horses and dogs and friends who were mostly boys. <laughs> and I was a tomboy, and then finally I did go off to boarding school to St. Catharines uh, in the ninth grade. In South Carolina? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. We still lived in South Carolina. In fact, always that's always home. Okay. Um, but this is in Richmond, Virginia. Okay. So I went off to school uh, for four years and... Then went to Sarah Lawrence College and started um, going to dove shoots with my husband-to-be, who also lived in Camden, but was quite a bit older. He was at Yale University, and we started going out 
in New York and Connecticut. Um, eventually, I just left Sarah Lawrence and got married. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, came, that's when I first came to Oklahoma with my husband. And uh, we first lived at Fort Sill mm -hmm. in the 50s. It was actually 57 that we uh, settled in Fort Sill, our first home. 50 years ago. Isn't that amazing? Fifty years ago. Oh my gosh! It does. It seems like yesterday sometimes. We the only fight we had initially was over whether we would take lightning with this. Lightning was a pointer dog, and my husband really didn't want to take him. But my parents thought he was too old, and we needed we needed a dog, and so lightning came out west with us. And because uh, we drove from South Carolina with this pointer dog, and my husband was grousing but accepting. And um, at one point, we let Lightning out of the car, and Lightning wouldn't come back. And finally, my husband found this dog pointing a cubby of quail <laughs> near the highway. So then he became part of the family. He's from that nice job. <laughs> I'm assuming you can edit all of this yes, out. Yes, <laughs> we can. Maybe we'll do some. Not a lot. Uh, well, when did you get interested in politics? Um, very late in life. My stepfather was pretty interested in politics, and as far as I knew at that time, he was one of only three people in Camden who read the New York Times. and. The Herald Tribune in those days, which was still um, an American paper, you know, now it's just an international paper, but he, he would read the Herald Tribune in the New York Times, and um, was always listening to the news. And so I got a little bit interested in wanting to get to know my stepfather better, because he was so avidly. I think I became most interested in politics when my husband, after the army left, left, uh, left the army after two years, we lived in Germany and had our first son over there, and he then went to work for a pipeline company, and we were sent to Iran, and it really wasn't until, well, I, st I started getting interested when I was in Germany, being pregnant lying on the sofa and reading books, because i that's when I first read about the Dreyfus case. That's the first book I read that I think made me really question um, the way I thought things were internationally compared to the way they probably were. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a, a dose of reality in reading that, the Dreyfus affair, and then uh, Sarge's book, you know, Le Castillon, mm -hmm. about, about Algeria and about the, um, those times, the, the French relationship to the world, and I then became a little interested in the French relationship to Vietnam and then the American relationship to Vietnam. And it wasn't really till I got to Iran that I began to look at America in a different way. And I kept reading about these things happening in the civil rights movement and, the, and um, with the Vietnam War and the teachings and um, learning that by that time I was reading the International Herald Tribune and the local Tehran paper. Um, and it was such a different view from the one I had gotten reading the Tulsa Tribune in the Tulsa World. It was a very, very different perspective on the world, much more international, obviously. Mm -hmm. But also, we got to know first just embassy people and Americans. And little by little, we got to know Persians, uh, the intelligentsia, and um, people who lived in the villages around Tehran. We just got to know all aspects of Persian life and the people there. And so began to see America 
through their eyes as well as our own. And it was just, I just couldn't wait to get back, even though I didn't want to leave. Um, we brought, we raised our children there. We had great four boys and raised the last of them, which was born in uh, Tehran, and um, were there all through the 60s. So I kept thinking, I can't wait to get back to America. I didn't know how valuable, you know, voting was and the political process and our government's right to participate in some way, and we were there during the Shah's time, and uh, people were gaining civil rights when we were there. They were uh, becoming literate in the villages. They were very sophisticated, much much more cultured in uh, Tehran than I was. I mean, most of us Americans uh, didn't speak languages. We were monolingual. And uh, it was just incredible to me to be with these people who could switch from Farsi to English to French to German to Russian, just, you know, four and five languages fluently without any thought given to any of it. Not people who gave themselves airs, they were just people who naturally switched from one to the other. And um, so I began to really marvel at that kind of fluency in the world, that kind of world literacy. That was new to me. And I came to appreciate it a lot. So that, so even the poorest people spoke at least two languages, possibly three. And French had earlier been the international language, and English, of course, by the time we got there in the 60s, was becoming the international language. So there were lots of people, even the poorest people, who could speak all three. I mean, unbelievable to me. Still is. Looking back on it now that I've been back in Oklahoma all these years, I'm even more amazed at other people in the world and how, how fluent and uh, like us in many ways, but also more cognizant of the way other people think and view the world. They have more, more perspectives, I think, than we do. Anyway, it was, uh, it was great to come home to America and couldn't wait to be involved politically. Never thought I'd run for office myself. And Join the League of Women Voters. So how did it come about then, if you didn't? Well, I just, I wanted to be involved, and so I got involved in, in voter registration, and at that time, I was still registered Republican, my family was all Republican, and my stepfather was working for Nelson Rockefeller at that time, and I thought it would be really exciting to try and get a few delegates to be for Nelson Rockefeller in 1968, and needless to say, we only got one, <laughs> and that was that took a lot of doing, and uh, we got one delegate out of all of those, and and um, then I realized the Republican Party in Oklahoma wasn't our Republican Party of the East Coast. I mean, it was really, really different and much more rigid, much less open-minded. Um, on the East Coast, it was you know very fiscally conservative, but also had been through hundreds of years of problems, which Oklahoma as a state had not been through. So they had kind of a, a, rich, a rich heritage of grappling with problems, and they weren't anti-government. I think that's what struck me the most about my Republican Party in Oklahoma, is that they were so many of them so anti-government, except for my mentor and hero, Henry Bellman, who had visited us when we were in Iran, and he also gave me the notion of politics as a, an honorable calling, mm -hmm. and a challenge, and a service, a kind of public service, and so he, he remained my mentor, even after I switched my registration to Democrat in 68. 
um, he still was a huge exception, and some of the people who worked for him were my kinds of Republicans. So we stayed in close touch, and I still, I was a Bellman Bell, you know, um, still worked for him, and, and Republicans like him, but just um, never thought of running for office myself. But it was a combination of issues. I'm just going on and on. Oh, you're doing fine. But it was really, um, I would say, working for greater justice in public education and more choices um, related to quality as well as equality mm -hmm. uh, for our own children. I really, when we brought our children back, they had had such a rich experience living in Iran, and they grew up speaking several languages, just like all the people around them. And so they came back to um, a monoculture, for sure, mm -hmm. wonderful, convenient, comfortable, but not challenging. It was just not... Nothing, I mean, we never had air conditioning in Iran. They even had air conditioned cars in Tulsa. I couldn't believe, we lived at the Maya Hotel before we bought a house and it was so amazing going from air conditioned hotel to air conditioned car. And, but we also had television. We never had television in Iran. So we could actually watch, you know, what was going on. So I became really involved in watching <laughs> politics and soon got involved in local politics, Jim Jones campaign. But mostly it was um, initially nonpartisan, League of Women Voters, voter registration, working on the North Side. Go ahead, I'll let you no, talk. I, I just say, blathered on. Tell a little bit about your first campaign then. Well, that really started in one sense, with the nonpartisan League of Women Voters. We, as a league, um, had gone through this whole time of uh, school integration and working for the Equal Rights Amendment. Those, those were the, the main two issues, education reform and, and equal rights, pushing for the Equal Rights Amendment, along with all these other organizations, Business and Professional Women and American Association of University with um, All of these groups were in a coalition, and so I got to know some of the Oklahoma City people and people from elsewhere in the state because we would meet at this little library in Stroud, have monthly meetings about um, this agenda education and equal rights. And I started getting to know the legislature because we were given assignments. People, people like Cleta. Uh, worked with us and um, told us who the really tough legislators were, but who the possible ones were who were open-minded enough, who cared about equal rights and civil rights, had cared about civil rights um, in the 60s and surely would support uh, equal rights for women in the, in the 70s. You know, it seemed so amazing to me that you could walk into a court of law and not be treated equally. As a woman. As a woman. I mean, that just still, it still blows my mind. The Equal Rights Amendment was 27 words long. And I didn't even know what it was, but Henry Bellman and David Bourne were co-chairmen of this committee called OKERA. And I thought, well, that's a snap. Of course we'll pass the Equal Rights Amendment if we have this bipartisan leadership for the Equal Rights Amendment. They chaired this committee and I was asked to be on it. And so I really got to know people, not just through the coalition of working with the League of Women Voters, but also some of the individuals who were very political, like Clea, and knew exactly who, who was a possible supporter. So, and it was really those, 
those two issues that got me down to the legislature. So I got down there, I thought, whoa, <laughs> I could do this. <laughs> Little did I know. But I thought, you know, these are just people like you and me. These are people who, who bring forth concerns of voters in their district, and they're, they're pretty ordinary. It was really not until I served in the legislature that I got to appreciate how extraordinary many of them that there really were. Some of them I disagreed with, but there were just some extraordinary people at the legislature. It was a great privilege to serve, but I, I really ran the first time because of my, um, my own representative, who was a Republican, and I had supported him because we were working on these two issues of ed education improvement and um, equal rights amendment passage. And he strongly supported both of those things and, you know, had bills to that effect. And um, his name is Paul Brunton. And so I got to know the legislature to some degree through him. And he just suggested one night we were hanging out after session, sitting around, and he said, you know, I'm not going to run for re-election and you should run for my seat. And I laughed and just... It is the first time I ever thought of running for office, and I put it out of my mind quickly. But it kept kind of coming back subconsciously. Um, I kept thinking about it. And, you know, it's different, I think, with men. Many men just think, sure, I could do that. I really didn't. I thought, oh, God, I'd never do that. And then people say, yeah, but your children have all grown, they've all left, you're not taking care of children this year, you could run in 1980, because they were all off in school. And I, yeah, I guess I could, but it just took me ages, and it was really through two of my best friends, Norma Eagleton and Patty Eaton, that I got my consciousness raised and got my nerve up, because we had worked Together we had worked to uh, elect Norma Eagleton to the first voting position a woman had ever held. Um, at that time in Tulsa we had a city commission, not, not a council, we had a city commission, and you were elected large, and there were five commissioners, and uh, so Norma was elected to finance commission. She was the finance commissioner, and it was quite a... Um, Quite a race. Did you knock on a lot of doors? Oh yeah. Or did you do some? No, else? lots of doors. I loved that part of the campaigning, and I loved getting. I mean, I just was had been overseas all through the sixties, and I was really almost starved to know who people were and what they cared about and what America was becoming and what Oklahoma was becoming. Because I always. I always um, have thought of America as a, as a kind of um, an idea as much as a place. This promise of America, this promise of the common wheel, a place that is acting for the public good. Um, and so I had very idealistic notions that didn't go away, even with all the cynicism over the Vietnam War and other issues when I was living in Iran. People still loved America. They may, they may not have loved Lyndon Johnson or Richard Nixon, but they loved the American people and the American ideas, the American notions mm -hmm. of freedom and fair play and... Um, Democratic Republic, not a pure democracy. Um, somehow we have promoted that uh, unwisely, just pure democracy overseas. And I think we've gone from one extreme to another as we've supported regimes overseas. Either, you know, the pure dictatorship, but they're for us, 
and uh, or pure democracy, however it ends up. And if it ends up with, you know, Hamas winning a popular election among Palestinians, and we don't like the result, then we turn our backs on it. So we say we're for democracy, but then we don't really like the results. It, it was easier when we had all those dictators, I think, for America to operate overseas. I mean, at least that's how we um, gathered allies, was dealing with dictators we knew we could deal with. And, but that's another story. Well, you're not interested in that right now. Uh, what, what was your first day that you were sworn in like? We had, um, I do, because I hadn't thought anything about being elected. I had only thought about whether I could win or not. And um, it, I was in a district that was very Republican, even though it was very independent. It was a district that had the University of Tulsa in it. And I was working at the University of Tulsa at the time I left my job to run for the legislature. Mm -hmm. And so really knew a lot of people living around that area, as well as people all over the district. And I knew that even though the registration and the voting was pretty Republican, it was also, um, could be a swing district wasn't necessarily a Republican district, and Democrats had sort of written it off as being a Republican district just because we'd always had Republicans representing us, including Frank Keating, who had, uh, you know, who was a governor, who became a governor later. Um, so once election day came, and to my great surprise, I really was elected, I knew it was only because of the hard work of so many people and that getting to know people one at a time. I mean, it's the kind of thing you never can really do in a larger race, but in a house district, 30,000 people uh, might have been, yeah, it was about 30,000. You can actually do that. I mean, in five months' time, four months' time, you can actually knock doors and meet people and communicate with them the ones you missed by phone. So I really did get to know the district pretty well, but mostly I think it was other people vouching for me. They knew me and we worked together on school integration or uh, education reform of one kind or another. And at lots of levels, I think I was just incredibly lucky to know people in every precinct. So it was a pretty personal election. Nonetheless, I'm, I didn't think I'd win. So I didn't think about the legislature at all. So boom, all of a sudden, I won, and then I started getting these phone calls. We have to be over there tomorrow. You know, we have a Democratic caucus. A what? And I had to switch gears so quickly. I, I thought, well, surely there's a day of rest. No. <laughs> it was, it, we all barreled over there, and this is where the Equal Rights Amendment came in, because we barreled over there, went and drove across the turnpike with this friend of mine, Don McCorkle, who had a great big van. And so all of us, who were Democrats, all barreled into this van and sped across the turnpike. For our first, for my first Democratic caucus, so to elect a Speaker of the House. Well, Cleta had introduced me to Dan Draper, and so obviously, and he was stronger for the Equal Rights Amendment. So I was, you know, a Dan Draper supporter. So mm -hmm. we could all vote for him as our Speaker. So that was, so that was almost like a, a no-brainer being able to support someone. And where was your office, your first office? And, and actually, that was with another guy um, on the third floor, which is where all the research people worked. There was a little suite of offices down there. So it was 
just great access to the education staff. Uh, most of the legislators were up on the fourth and fifth floors, but there were some of us who were freshmen who got to be down on the third floor next to the staff and next to the education committee chairman. And it was, um, I, am, I am thinking, if my memory is failing me, I'm glad you can edit this, because two years earlier, we had all elected representatives who would vote for Dan Draper. So, we, so it may have been 78 that Dan became speaker instead of 80. Um, but we all, we all supported him. And we all, in working for the Equal Rights Amendment, um, Cleta introduced us all, and we all, that was part of our overall strategy to support him. And uh, so that is, I'm going to have to look that up. That is a week late. Well, we can look too. <laughs> well, do you remember presenting your first bill? I remember asking my first questions. You know, we were told as freshmen, just kind of lie low your first, your first year, just learn the lay of the land. And, and that did take me two years, just to learn which direction the capital went, which door I walked out of, which you know, the east, west, north, and south, I was always getting confused. The building kept turning around. And I do remember my first question. And there were, speaking of women, there were five of us women who got elected from Tulsa County. All that in that 1980? Mm -hmm. Okay. And Joan Hastings, Republican, and Helen Arnold, Republican, had already been in the legislature. But there were three new Democrats. So we had a total, it was our all-time high, a total of five women legislators in the House from Tulsa. And Aline Baker and Twyla Mason and I were the three new ones. And uh, we all, except for John Hastings, we all supported the Equal Rights Men. Helen Arnold was an ardent supporter of the Equal Rights Men. At any rate, there we were, we women, sitting in this committee um, on uh, the judiciary. We actually were on the subcommittee of uh, juvenile justice. That was my interest, was policy for young people. But we were on this larger committee of the ju judiciary, and a legislator by the name of Frank Sheridan had this bill. He became known, you know, as a, as a legislator who was for castration for those who had committed rape. And, uh, but he, at this point, he had this bill that called for alternate death sentences for uh, criminals, Con convicted criminals. They could choose uh, how they how they were going to die, how they would be put to, to death. And I kept listening to this bill and these other women on the committee who, you know, these big Equal Rights Amendment supporters were saying, oh, yeah, great, that's just so American, you know, you freedom of choice. And I was thinking, what's wrong with this picture? So I, I finally got up my nerve and asked my first question, and that was, well, how, how would you write the drop description uh, for the executioner? I mean, we're, not, we're talking about people. One of the lines of the bill was, um, you, may choose, you may choose to die um, in the way you did in your victim. It was kind of screwy language, and then everybody started looking at the language. And so finally we defeated the bill, the alternative death penalty bill. But it was just a funny, a funny bill. And so then I found out that I really could ask a question, and 
and that questions can sometimes lead to the right outcome if you just find the right questions. So I spent a lot of my time developing the right questions, but one, the issue I had run on was equal treatment for Tulsa. Uh, above all other issues of equality, I thought that it was way past time for us to have equal access to higher education in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We were the largest metropolitan area in the United States without a four-year college. Tax or taxpayer paid public education. We didn't have it. We had a two-year college, a junior college, but nothing beyond that. And so you could look at the statistics and see all around Oklahoma City and Norman and Edmond area, you had all these people with degrees compared to Tulsa. I mean, it was about 15 to 20% difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you went out of Tulsa and included Bartlesville, then you got a little different picture. But if you just looked at the metropolitan area of Tulsa, we were way behind Oklahoma City and it really was a question of access. So I thought we should have some kind of higher education. And Tulsa State University or uh, uh, OSU Tulsa or uh, but a, you know, a co-equal branch. Uh, and that was not popular. Uh, none of those options were popular. So my first two years of the legislature, I really didn't act like a freshman on that one issue. On every other issue, I acted just like a freshman. But on that issue, I just didn't know any better. I just kept acting the way I'd acted in the campaign and pulling people together and groups together. And I, would, I mean, I look back on this with some embarrassment because I would send out a meeting notice and invite all of these senators and House members and I'd get this committee room. I learned you could get a committee room and I just, I, you know, all these powerful people and well-known people, Finus Smith, who'd been president pro tem of the Senate, and Bill Polis and Charlie Ford and all these well-known legislators who'd been there for ages. Um, Roger Randall, my immediate mentor, and um, it, he didn't object. So I thought it must be okay. And so we just would convene these meetings. And looking back on it, you know, then, then I realized two or three years later that actually it was a question of seniority. The, long, the, the legislator who'd been there the longest would convene the meetings of the delegation and things like that. But we went through a lot of uh, versions of a bill to get Tulsa some public higher education, and uh, I just kept losing bill after bill. And then finally, one day, Twyla Mason Gray, who was Twyla Mason at that time, was reading the records. She kept reading the journals to reflect on votes from appropriations and various committees. And she found where the Appropriations Committee had never voted for the higher ed appropriation. They just had sent it on out to the floor. And so someone raised an objection about the higher ed bill. And meanwhile, we've been working with legislators from all around the state to try and get them to um, fall in with us and support equal opportunities for Tulsa higher ed. And uh, so lo and behold, this point of order was made on the floor of the House and um, that the bill had not been officially passed and signed out of appropriations, the appropriation uh, on higher education. And so we voted no against the final passage of the bill, which was the emergency which gave all these institutions their money immediately instead of three months from that day. So the emergency clause was important to have. Um, obviously the bill passed, but the leadership couldn't get the emergency. 
And Robert Henry was in the emergency. He's the one legislator I think of who was not from Tulsa, who threw in with us. He was from Shawnee. And he uh, was head of judiciary. And so he was threatened with his chairmanship and said he needed to change his vote. And then he got more and more adamant and outraged. And so we had a, just this horrible stalemate. And we all, we Republicans and Democrats, met in the office of uh, our Transportation Committee Chairman, Bob Hopkins. He was the only one from Tulsa who had a large enough office for us to meet in. And we would sit around the room and think, what will be our next move? And we had held up the whole legislature and made the speaker look very weak. And But we couldn't budge. We couldn't rank ranks. And finally, one of our number, was a Republican, said, I think maybe it's time to go uh, take Dan Draper a peace offering and have a little talk with him after session. I don't know, take him a bottle of whiskey or something. And so that was Jim Forrester from Tulsa. So we said, OK, give it a try to see what comes of it. And he was right. Dan Draper was ready to um, compromise. But he was from Stillwater, so OSU would have been fine. But the former speaker, Bill Willis from Tahlequah, with Northeastern down there, apparently was going to veto that idea. And so they kept thinking, what can they give Tulsa that's not too much, but that gets gets through. And we actually came up with this idea of a consortium. We had, uh, Roger Randall and I had been to Denver, we had seen her area, and it, we thought it was a great idea putting these public uh, colleges together on one campus, having little branches, and um, so having a student be able to get the first two years, you know, at a junior college and the next two years at a branch of one of the universities, and actually in their case it was the University of Colorado, and go on to graduate work. At any rate, uh, finally, I think they thought that's probably the least we can do, the, the, the most harmless thing we could do. And um, so that's what we finally agreed to. I was enthusiastically for it. I thought this could be great as long as we had enough control in the board so that we could be assume charge of our own destiny in Tulsa. At any rate, I'm taking you way too long. I will just say that for years after that, we kept trying to strengthen the board so we didn't have to just sit and get whatever crumbs the regions decided to throw us. And, uh, by 1990, I was really ready to focus on comment. And I've been all, th all through the 80s. I really focused on this, this equal access issue at the level of higher education, uh, but also at the same time, greater quality in higher education because we had 27 colleges mm -hmm. and the traditional way to treat them was um, across the board. And in some ways, when I, when I passed a bill on future teacher scholarships, uh, I was so proud of myself because I'd gotten you know, $200,000 for uh, scholarships for future teachers, but instead of making them uh, life-changing possibilities for people in higher education, so we could recruit people from math and science and core subject areas, the regents chose to 
give to divide up the money to people who are already in the pipeline going to get education degrees anyway. I mean, that was just typical of what happened <laughs> once we got the money to the regions. And then in such small amounts, like instead of a $5,000 scholarship, like a $500 scholarship and lots of them. So that, but it was so typical. So the money would be like taking a Dixie cup of water and throwing it out there on Lake Kista. It would just vanish. You couldn't see any dramatic impact. And so I kept trying to get back to this notion of, of um, raising our sense of possibilities, that, that really we could do a lot better in Oklahoma. And, and we just didn't think enough of ourselves, or we thought, somehow we thought we couldn't be an education state. We were always in the bottom five states on these human issues, whether it was health or human services or education or mental health or you know any of the people's areas. We were always in the lowest of the low states. And that seemed absurd to me, to have a state of this kind of wealth and to be this low a, t a taxing state. I mean, we were. 49th or 50th on ad valorem taxes, um, historically. And you could go to move to Texas or New Jersey and your taxes would be three and four times what they were in Oklahoma. But still, we didn't seem to have the belief that we could do any better. So we just became this sort of frustrating exercise. And the only way I finally learned it was too hard to take on the system, it was just too hard to reform the system, so my strategy was to create models. And the University Center at Tulsa, UCAT we called it, was supposed to be such a model. We could really create a great model where the best education from anywhere could be imported as long as the board had the clout and the money to import education Tulsans needed and were demanding and companies really um, had the need for it. and individuals had the need for it. So I started feeling the same way about common ed that there isn't enough variety in, in um, common education and, and some people don't have the chance I had to go to a small rural school or to go to just a small school in a small town. Um, there, you, and the choices we were able to exercise for our children. Some of them went to private school, you know, one would go to a public school, one would go to a private school. We were back and forth, but we were very privileged. We had the right and the, and the means to make those choices. Most of the parents in the public school system didn't have those choices. For whatever reason, you had two working parents, or you had um, various limitations. And so I thought, well, then public, public education itself needs to have more variety to it. So we created um, alternative education, where students who had not done well or who had dropped out of, of public schools had another chance to still gain it, get a degree through another route. Um, they might have been disruptive in school. They might have been bored. You know, 23 to 25 percent of those kids. <laughs> you have one? Well, I mean, a lot of them just didn't find public school that challenging. And so we created eventually the system of alternative education where a lot more money went. Initially, we started off with just pilot projects and demonstration grants and everything. And this school in Tulsa, the street school, became a national model. So I had been working on that before I was in the legislature. So it was natural just to continue working with the street school when I was on their board and got to know that one school pretty well. And so knew it could be a model for the state. So at any rate, so we created that kind of system. And then we had these, um, these summer arts Institutes, institute uh, at Quartz Mountain, 
under the uh, Oklahoma Art Institute, where really talented uh, students in about eight arts disciplines, you know, dancing and theater and writing and visual art, uh, mu musicians, symphony music, I mean, just all across the board in these arts disciplines, these students would go for these incredible two weeks at Quartz Mountain in the summer. And so eventually in the 80s, we created this model for math and science. We felt that math and science was so undervalued in Oklahoma and many employers were telling us that they would get graduates who had insufficient math and science background and they had to uh, import a lot of their talent. Mm -hmm. So with Robert Henry we did a series of bills to strengthen math and science and I did the math and science school and he did the um, Oklahoma, at that time it was the Institute for Science and Technology um, as an interim study. <laughs> this dog is just, Blackie, you are unbelievable. Anyway, anyway, I'm boring myself, so I know I'm boring you and Blackie too. Yeah, yeah. Well, what went into your thinking of switching from the House to the Senate? Then? That was just easy because um, right, yeah, I had an opponent every time, and it was always a big fight to get reelected. Usually a male or female? Um, male. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember. I had, I had a female opponent one time, uh, but I always had an opponent. And um, it was just a big struggle. And I would get some momentum making some progress on the education front. And then I'd have to run for re-election. And some politicians were able to just always be politicians and be very effective and not have to all of a sudden switch gears. I wasn't that way. I mean, I think the worst thing that happened with me is I got down to that legislature and I was so in awe of the process and how people got bills passed and how people were successful. I became kind of like a student of the process, but not always able to copy the people I'd learned so much from, uh, feeling much less effective than what I knew, but I certainly lost all of my sense of irony and detachment, aesthetic distance, maybe they call it. I just became like this. So all of a sudden, here was the prospect of running for an office that had a four-year uh, term. And that would be so great, because I know I'm a lousy politician. I'm not going to be a politician from day one and do all these politically correct things. I'm just not going to do that. Um, and so, and, and not because I was above it. I just couldn't function that way. I just, I, I, I was aware of things I was told I should do, but I procrastinated. And I would always answer phone calls, but I didn't always answer letters by, by mail, you know. I tried to reach people, and I didn't always get back. So I always had fences to mend when I ran for re-election. It was always really tough. So I was so interested in the public policy front that I was very happy for the term when Roger Randall uh, ran for mayor. Then his Senate seat, of course, became vacant. So I ran for his sentencing. So that was just a natural. And I don't remember it being that difficult. You know, all of these races sort of swim into my conscience. I never had a Democrat opponent. I'm no Democrat wanted to run for this seat. It was House District 70 and then Senate District 33. And I never, in 24 years, I never had one Democrat opponent. Well, what was the biggest change in that time period over 24 years? Some things had to... I think the biggest change was um, how we expressed our relationship to money. 
we had, we've always had a very unrealistic relationship to money in Oklahoma. Somehow believing that we could get a free lunch. And we were told by various governors, you're doing fine, Oklahoma, you're number one. And we had been number one in football, one of our universities, you know, OU, uh, for instance, had, had been several times number one. But we weren't. We were number 48 and 49 in funding for education. And, and so when I was busily creating models during the 80s, with the help of lots of like-minded other people, uh, and coalition forming, we still, in overall terms, were way down. Um, we were the victims of boom and bust economy, and I will say that Governor Hall raised taxes in the 70s, and we lived off the economies that came after that so that we were able to cut taxes like 30 different ways, 30 different times. So there was plenty of tax cutting, yet we were still increasing our financial commitment to some of these essential services and education. But then when the bust cycle came, because we had never, through the 70s, we never did rebates, we never did temporary, you know, we never cushioned the shock of uh, the oil industry, the oil, the price of, of oil going down. We never prepared ourselves for that. We didn't do any long range planning. So the bust really got us in, I would say, 80, 82, 83, just at the time we were trying to get the state to make an additional commitment to higher ed in Tulsa we started suffering this bust and oil prices plummeting. And that was such a huge part of our state budget. And so we had to increase taxes, and still we didn't increase them enough. But I, when I was in the House, we increased taxes four different times under different governors, um, and the last one being Henry Bellman because it was the only way we could keep ourselves above board. Blackie, this is not your house and you don't get to bark. You just have to be patient. So anyway, um, Henry Bellman said at one time, we need to, we need to um, raise teacher salaries. And he had been, we, we created this long range planning committee when I was in the house. We had a House Senate Long Range Planning Committee uh, because we hadn't really been ready for these times. And um, it had a three year life, and we accomplished just about everything we set out to do. Uh, and so our third year was. Uh, a, a report was submitted when Henry Bellman came in to his initial year as governor. And so he took, he looked at the education part of this, and uh, we did a lot of the reforms we called for, the Ethics Commission and, you know, some of these things. But the education part, we really hadn't done much on the education front with some of those suggestions. And so he took those recommendations and kind of played with them in his head for a while and met with the uh, Oklahoma Education Association teachers. And I think AFT was also involved, uh, but they're a, a lesser union in Oklahoma. They're mainly just in Oklahoma City. Uh, at any rate, Henry Bowman met, met with these teachers and he agreed we should, we should have salaries at least at the regional level. He said, as far as I'm concerned, we should, every teacher should make $5,000 more apiece. You know? So we took that and said, hey, yes, that's a great idea, let's go. 
the long and short of it was we had we put together an education reform task force, Task Force 2000, and that was probably that was one of the most important bills I ever did. And created that without any legislators on it. We had some some journalists, some newspaper people, and um, business people, and teachers. And George Singer from Tulsa chaired it and wrote and just an incredible set of recommendations, shifting the whole shifting the whole focus of education from one of rules and regulations regulation enforcement to outcomes, looking at results. How were our students doing? Were they learning? Were they successful? Were they ready for the next grade? Were they ready for college? Were they ready for, the, for high school? Were they ready for junior high, middle school? Were they even ready for kindergarten? And we just kept getting further back thanks in large part to this first ever independent study we had had of higher education that um, Carolyn Thompson had authored when she was a freshman in the house. Remember how we as freshmen get things done because we don't know any better? That's when I did UCAT and that's when she did this higher ed independent study. Anyway, this independent study kept getting us, forcing us back further. And Henry Bellman already had had, with three daughters himself and a large commitment to early childhood education, way before his time, way before the time when early childhood uh, education was a priority in Oklahoma, he, he'd had a long-standing commitment to it. So that was an important part of 1017. Steve Lewis and Bob Carlson are legislative leaders, were strongly committed to that part of the education bill. So we passed this bill reflecting the recommendations. Now the recommendations of Task Force 2000 had dramatically shifted our focus in education from these, from these, uh, the enforcement of uh, rules and regulations uh, that didn't have a whole lot to do with quality. Uh, shifted the focus to how students did. And the legislation didn't dramatically, didn't as dramatically as the recommendations call for reflect those recommendations, I mean, reflect that shift. But nonetheless, the bill, it's called 1017, did shift the priority in education. The problem is we didn't repeal enough education law. And so we still had this huge book of education law that all of our dollars at the State Department, 500 employees strong, was bent on enforcing. So it was very hard to open windows and doors and make changes to this cumbersome system that didn't always prepare students for college. I will tell you one thing. I do remember when I was uh, a freshman and wrote to the state superintendent at the time and said, shouldn't we be distributing uh, this new report, what students need to know and be able to do to be ready for college? Shouldn't we be uh, distributing this to the schools, and he said, "No, that's that's not necessary." I think I still have that correspondence. <laughs> I mean, can, and so really, we shouldn't we shouldn't get this out to the high schools. They don't need to know that. So, you know, we did a lot of after ten seventeen passed. We did a lot of adjustments along those lines because we really thought they weren't going to come from these leaders' offices, that it is up to legislators and policy makers and, and governors to, to show our departments of education and regions' offices in the land that it's really okay for 
students to do a lot better academically and to be a lot readier for the 21st century and the global economy. And, but we were ahead of our time when we were calling for this, but it's okay. And the minute we pass a bill, it was okay with them too. They just wanted the protection of legislation and the governor's signature before they changed anything. Anyway, that's my jaded, that is my jaded view of how education works and it's very, I mean, you just almost have to create exceptions like alternative certification where you let a few people who speak lots of languages and love kids and, and uh, are able to help and are willing to help and are imaginative people and competent, um, but don't fit the system, you know, because they haven't been to squares one, three, mid-career people. Yeah. So we did that, even though we did that as um, an issue in 1017 with the label alternative certification, we almost made it worse. The language almost made it. So every year after 1017, we would come back and we'd have a bill that would improve and strengthen aspects of 1017. And we, we mandated that we be part of the National Academic Education Progress Report, NAEP. We mandated that we have money going for advanced placement courses and testing and teaching and teacher uh, orientations about advanced placement subjects. And we mandated that we have um, something OSU did when Smith Holt was Dean of Arts and Sciences, was revolutionary in getting uh, German classes out to the Panhandle and advanced English, uh, advanced placement English out to these schools, Beaver and some of the schools out, out west there in the Panhandle, uh, all of a sudden had two and three and four schools they were partnering with to have one professor who came over television. Uh, Talk back TV was the first method, but eventually they got more sophisticated and Oklahoma was one of the leading states in making um, college professors accessible in these core subject areas we were so behind in uh, making them available. And, uh, I think we just did a lot of things through those years, but it all took a lot of pushing. Um, it wasn't it just wasn't, if it hadn't been for people like Smith Holt who initiated things, and he became uh, Henry Bellman's Secretary of Education uh, before Henry, uh, before Sandy Garrett became Secretary of Education, we had Smith Holt. So he was on the uh, uh, Arts and Science, what's the uh, the name of the board, not, not uh, ACT, but... Um, Education, ETS, Education Testing Service out of Princeton. That sounds right. Yeah, oh, they did. We have these two systems, um, and we're, we're an ACT state. So most, most of our students take, take the ACT core courses. But Smith Holt had been on this other board where they had, uh, and they're the ones who put out the report, what student, students need to know to be able to do to be ready for college. Um, he did initiate an awful lot of things that made higher education more accessible to high school students. And eventually, ultimately, for seventh and eighth grade students. And we were just, we were just incredibly fortunate to have people like that to work with, um, who were very focused on quality and the reality of change, dramatic, deep change that was coming. And um, George Nye had a terrific Secretary of Education. It wasn't formally called that, but I think it was coordinator or something, but Carolyn Smith was just fabulous. And are you from Oklahoma? Do you? Tennessee. You're what? From Tennessee. Okay. Well, see, Tennessee was one of these lead states, too, because we had even gotten out of the Southern Regional Education Board. This was another thing that was very important for us. 
getting back into that compact where um, we have interchangeably graduate courses that are free or you're treated across this compact like an in-state student. If you're in one of these southern states, mm -hmm. um, market. common market education. And so in veterinary medicine and things we were strong in that neighboring states might not have strength in, their students could come into Oklahoma for in-state to be treated like residents of Oklahoma and only pay in-state uh, tuition. And we had this going all through the South. But Oklahoma had gotten out of, SREB it's called, this compact because our chancellor at the time thought we're better than those southern states. And it is true. In terms of how our students do, we are not in the bottom five. In terms of how our students do, we're always in the upper realms uh, on results. I'd say in the top 20. But in terms of the money we put into education and invest in our students, we're always in the bottom five. But you were talking about what changed. I'm sorry, I went so far astray. Um, what really changed was this relationship that Oklahomans, this unrealistic relationship Oklahomans have had to money. Because this cult of, um, it's almost uh, like a, a religion. No taxes or lower taxes. And, and the people who had been part of the state before started gaining the upper hand, little by little by little, that drumbeat of no new taxes and tax cuts and this kind of thinking that this is what wins elections, um, combined with the reaction against the 80s when we raised taxes four times, and Pat then passed this education improvement investment because we passed the money to pay for these improvements to education, lowering class size and those kinds of things. Um, a group formed that was anti-legislator, uh, that was anti-taxes, anti-government, you know, uh, anti services, and especially letting legislators struggle and agonize over priorities and what should be invested in and what should not be. So we had this uh, state question, oh, maybe it was 69, um, I'm not sure about the number. So it was a state question that said no taxes without a vote of the people. You know, unless the legislature overwhelmingly, like three-fifths of the legislature would support such a thing, um, we, couldn't, we couldn't raise taxes without a vote of the people. And uh, at that same time, they had a vote to repeal the taxes we had raised for education in 1017, and so we had a repeal fight on our hands in 90, so we passed 1017 in 1990, so we had to um, mount a campaign to vote no on repealing 1017. So as far as I know, we were certainly the only state in the South, maybe the only state, but the only state in the South, which now numbers 16 states, we the only state in the South to actually vote on um, taxes to, to invest in improving education. And we voted no, not to repeal 1017. But it was a tough fight and it was a, you know, it was a very hard vote. And then right after that, the next vote was to uh, make it impossible for the legislature ever again to vote for taxes just by a simple majority in an emergency clause. And then um, 
another vote was to limit legislative terms. So people um, could not be reelected after they'd served 12 years. I'd been there for a while once that passed, and so I actually got to stay 24 when it went into effect. Uh, but this has become almost um, like a like a religion, not not to tax ourselves, and you know, to me, this is the price of membership. We're so fortunate to live in America, and this you asked me about the watershed time in my life politically. It really was living in the Middle East and seeing how fortunate we were in America, just how fortunate, and how fortunate we were to have the great education system we had and to have the arts develop and the cultural development that we had and where other countries were investing in the arts and proud of their arts. Um, we in Washington were starting to go the other way, to disinvest in the arts or just to have, you know, the arts for people who could afford the arts, mm -hmm. not for the public. And uh, to me, that's the whole point of America, is that we may have a widespread incomes, but our culture is created by and should be available and accessible to all of us. You know, not just those rarefied few who can afford to go to and keep an art museum going, or we'd never we never have our culture. We would just have, we would just have um, artisans working for the moneyed classes, and we went beyond that. That was the experiment of America a long time ago, was to have this accessible education for, for all. And, and they meant what they said back in those days, and I think uh, Governor Riley of South Carolina, when he was Secretary of Education in Washington, under Bill Clinton, he meant what he said. You know, all means all. It's all of our children. And they're going to be paying our Social Security in our generation. And at least, at least we haven't done in Oklahoma what we did nationally. We haven't borrowed from our grandchildren. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. But I will say this. On the other hand, we haven't invested in them either. You know, we passed a bill called No Child Left Behind. And I was passionately for that notion, had, had been all through the 70s and 80s when Marion Wright Edelman and Hillary Clinton, who was a governor's wife at the time in Arkansas, um, she was on that board, when they called for leaving no child behind and made this pledge of no child left behind. And then when George Bush came and took that that goal and you know made a motto of it. I th I was wildly enthusiastic. I thought this is this is the commitment we need. We need it in a bipartisan legislation, but then we didn't fund it. So when you have we fund partially funded it, but to really have to really leave no child behind, we really have to do what the bill says and to fund the bill. Well, Congress didn't do that. They didn't fully fund it, but they mandated everything. So we, the states, have to pay for everything, or just we just get to grass about it. Uh, and and then we go off on these wars. I won't say these wars. I'll say the Iraq War, the invasion of Iraq, because that is what has really uh, raised the debt and raised the deficit. And we never pay for it out of out of our own money, Republican principles of, of pay as you go, forget that. That's an Oklahoma principle, but it is not a national principle anymore. That is out the window. It's the most extravagant caper I've ever seen. And it's at the expense of your grandchildren and my grandchildren, because they're going to have to pay for it at the same time they are being given this debt. We're saying no to investing them. We will not pay for more health insurance for them. We will not fully fund No Child Left Behind. And, and so that's where I'm left, with unfinished business. And that is my 
my, the bottom line of where I left the legislature. I felt I left the legislature after 24 years with unfinished business. I finally knew some things we really did need to do. And it, it, after we passed 1017 in 1990, they kept creeping up on me. I kept going to meetings and learning more about what other states were doing and other people were doing. And yes, we finally did rejoin Southern Regional Education Board. So we were part of the Southern states. And I'm so proud of them because they have become the leaders in goal setting for the nation because we set goals for ourselves as Southern states and as Oklahoma. But the one thing, if I could think of one thing that I really wanted to do that didn't, I didn't get done was a very targeted investment in underfinanced schools that are underperforming schools where the best teachers, the most experienced teachers, or the newest, freshest, most enthusiastic teachers should be gone. The absolute best in our system ought to be operating for those children who are being the least successful. Because they're the ones who are going to have to, those are those ones who are going to have to pay our Social Security and, and provide the future for our country. But whenever we have the chance in Congress, we vote against them. And even in the Oklahoma legislature, we have voted against them, even though we may have passed a bill in the Senate to target priority funding for turnaround schools um, and innovation and principal training and all the rest. Um, I mean, a new kind of principal leadership training and uh, whatnot, taking the best of what's worked, what's most effective, and bringing it to bear to support those children in being successful. I, I felt we didn't do that. We learned we should do it, and it took us years to learn it. We started learning it with 1017, but it's the one part of 1017 we never came back and seriously funded or targeted. So I just feel, I don't feel like a total failure, but I feel like I didn't finish what I set out to do. But you accomplished an awful lot. Well, I, I pushed. I just, that's how I see myself, is this very sort of unpleasant person coming down the halls. People would say, whoop! <laughs> Let's run the other direction so we don't have to do this. And uh, Bob Collison used to tease me about going to these conferences and coming back with new ideas of what other states were doing and why couldn't we do that? And he said, look, I'll prove you're going to the conference. Just don't go to the meetings. <laughs> it's too expensive. So it's too expensive for Oklahoma because all, all of these ideas do cost money because you, you invest in teachers. And we did, you know, one thing we did, one, one of the first states, early states to do it, was investing in the $5,000 bonus for teachers who were able to gain national uh, certification. And that's, they say it's as close to merit pay as, as we'll ever get, but it doesn't, it, it, these teachers are heroic, and what they have to go through to pass that certification is unbelievable. But I also think effectiveness is the important thing. Mm -hmm. And make, helping students make games who have a lot uh, yet to learn and need to learn it fast and need to be on that road to catching up. And there are incredibly resourceful teachers who can help them do it. And we ought to have some kind of bonus, you know, for teachers who are really willing to uh, go into the lowest, lowest performing schools, let's say, and affect turnarounds. Turns around? Anyway, um, I just keep, I keep. 
going on and on, and I don't mean to do that. I hate to think of our time. But you can edit. That's the one thing I say to myself when I when I go on. I'm sorry, I'm not more interesting. I am no, really boring my brain. This is this has been great. Uh, what have you done since you got out of office? My mother lost her husband, my stepfather, um, just about a month after I got just a month after Christmas, after I got out of the legislature. So I pretty much had been involved in South Carolina, my home state, for the last two years. You know, it's interesting. I mean, South Carolina is such is such a state. It's just as idiosyncratic as Oklahoma, in a way. I mean, it just it has these funny things about, you know, Oklahoma, we have Turkey Mountain, and, you know, it's 500 feet high or something. We have these things we call mountains that are little hills, and... In South Carolina, um, South Carolina was the first, was the state, the state to secede from the Union and lead all those states into secession. And it's the only state in our Union that's been majority black. And yet they have, they have somehow struggled and become a really uh, progressive state. I mean, they're in the process of becoming progressive, it, especially were they progressive when Governor Riley was the governor. Dick Riley is, is one of my heroes. Uh, and he just, after two years of voting no, the legislature finally voted yes to education improvement, and they did a penny sales tax to pay for it. And so we kind of copied them in the 90s, uh, 10 years later when we did our bill. Uh, the difference is, ours went to a vote of the people. And theirs, and theirs didn't. But we did a lot of the same kinds of things that um, South Carolina had done. But there's, they have such a long way to go. So they're still down in the bottom five states, too, in terms of, of results. But I got, uh, I spent a lot of time in South Carolina the last two years. And so I see, I see how similar we are in our strivings and in our difficulties, in the difficulties to overcome. It's, really been amazing and um, my mother lived for two more years and so that was just an incredible time and opportunity that I had to be able to be with her not having to be in legislative session to be with her and her prized dog I brought back to Oklahoma yes and um, and now I'm home from South Carolina um, and expecting one new grandchild in Tennessee. My oldest son lives in Tennessee and I have one grandson and we'll gain another one here shortly. And then I have two grandchildren who were moving today from Montana to Colorado where my other son Peter lives in Boulder, Colorado. And so now I will have two sons in Boulder, Colorado. Yeah, and their families. So this will be a much easier commute than Montana. So that so Colorado will become my other state, and Tennessee will become my other state instead of South Carolina. Well, is there anything I need to ask that I haven't, or that we haven't covered? Oh. As a, as a group of women, the five from Tulsa, did yeah. you guys stay tight when you were there? Uh, On Tulsa issues, always. Um, on the Equal Rights Amendment, um, Joan Hastings, you know, what didn't support the Equal Rights Amendment, but the four of us did. Um, did you live in the same place, or did you I mean, we, like share a no, share We lived house in, different, in different places. And um, in actuality, I think, I did live at one time in the same complex uh, Helen Earl lived in but different parts of the complex, so we didn't really know each other. And Norma Eagleton was there on the Corporation Commission, and she lived in that complex, but all three of us lived in, in different parts of it. Did you notice different treatment between men and women early on? And that had A lot. And, and that is where um, numbers do matter. I, I didn't believe that, but I learned it 
in the legislature. And so that when you get um, a number of committee members who are women, there's a lot we can do, especially if we're from different ends of the ideological or political spectrum. If we agree on an issue, um, it's hard to stop us. Uh, I can think of some issues where we got run over, you know, like, I don't know, the, the uh, gun carry law, you know, the, Concealed weapons law and uh, capital punishment, corporal punishment. You know, sometimes we would just get run over, but a lot of times we'd be together on on some of these civilizing issues. They used to call them the nineteenth century. Some of these uh, issues that tend toward the problem solving end of things instead of the uh, immediate, swift <laughs> well, you sword. Were, you were managed, managed to do the breast cancer. Breast, breast cancer we did, um, and Betty Boyd, when she was in the legislature, she and I did a number of bills together, and it was so great having her. Uh, we did the um, anti-genetic, anti-discrimination in, in genetic background for employment and insurance. And now the federal government is um, on the verge of passing a bill that's is very much like the bill we passed in Oklahoma. And we did um, the, a number of things like that we had bipartisan support on, like the not just the breast cancer legislation, but um, the drive-through deliveries. Have you heard? But that where you just had 24 hours, because if the insurance companies, you know, in the days when HMOs came into existence, and so you had this wedge of the insurance company and the HMO and the doctor and the, uh, the patient, uh, you had this huge other presence there determining the length of hospital stays for pregnancies and um, birth. So we changed that from, because um, more and more they were doing for insurance reimbursement, just these 24 hours. It's, you know, baby pops out, and then the next day you pop out of the hospital and you're home with no differentiation for women who needed another day or two in the hospital because things weren't going well. And then they couldn't get reimbursed if they stayed. And so that was. And I will say that even, even the insurance lobbyists agreed with us on that one. I just know that there were some under, off camera who, who were sympathetic and didn't really fight it out of the open. And so we were able to pass Republicans and Democrats acting together. We were able to pass some of this legislation that benefited women and children. And so it was only when you got to those wedge issues that were brought up intentionally to make legislators look bad, if they had the courage to look bad, like the abortion issues and some of those. It was only when you got to those kinds of issues that we parted company. Mostly, we women were together on, on education issues, um, almost always, not always. But Betty Boyd and I always were, and um, on choices in public education, you know, we just kept improving that part of 1017, charter schools, uh, choice between and among schools, and you know, things like that we eventually just legislated. And I hate a heavy-handed legislature. What I'd love to have is a legislature that sets standards and says, you districts, you find out any way you can to meet these standards and come up with these results while not breaking federal law. Um, and then we'll have books that are this thick instead of this thick. <laughs> because there's just so, many, so much a compliance mentality instead of let's make big gains. Let's, let's support our students in making big games or helping them through problem times. 
we should uh, just bring more of our resources to bear on that. There were lots of other issues that I worked on. I just mentioned education because that's that's the area where I feel and and have this great hope, this sense of unfinished business of really of not successfully targeting the student population not doing so well. Well, and we here. know who those schools are. We know who those students are in, in those schools. And we just look at them and say, mm, isn't that interesting? Without really making a commitment to help them turn around. And I just think that's immoral. And so it's that moral obligation I now feel to them that took me too long to build towards um, that I feel is just still unfinished business. And they're poor kids. Let's face it, they're the poorest. It just so happens that the students who are the poorest have the lowest scores. Mm -hmm. And you can take the lowest 30 schools in Oklahoma and know that you have an obligation to do some targeting, and not just with money, but getting foundations to help, getting mentors, getting volunteers, getting people to do field work there uh, as part of their teaching um, in service. And there's so many things that could be done if we had them center focus, and I just feel that's, that's unfinished business. Well, do you see yourself getting some of it finished in, in some capacity? Maybe. I, I now have time to, um, to take a good long look at things, especially when I'm somebody. on the road in between Colorado and Tennessee. And yeah, I will in some way be involved in cultural development, um, and um, poverty issues at some at some level. I I just don't know yet uh, where I can be most helpful. I, I will say that the one area I felt most successful in that surprisingly was a very tough area when I was in the legislature, uh, other than um, in education, was in the area of property taxes. When we Democrats were in the majority in the 80s and uh, Speaker Bill Willis was kind of the Speaker Emeritus and the grand old man of the House, and he headed the Revenue and Tax Committee in the House, and he would not, year after year, I would come up with a bill to, to at least raise the, the ceiling for people who were uh, exempt from property taxes, you know, uh, people of $5,000 income a year, you would think they would uh, be exempt. And then, you know, finally he let me raise that to 7500 and then finally to 12000 and then finally we, when I was in the Senate, we inched it up some more. But I felt that I finally did break the logjam on that front, and so Every two years after that, they let me, L-E-T, <laughs> let me have a bill uh, to, make, to make some improvement, to strengthen um, that area of, of law so people could stay in their houses if they were 80 and they're 80 years old and their houses they've lived in all their lives have gone up on the market. Uh, they still should be able to stay in their houses if they only have a certain amount of income. Anyway, uh, little by little, we've made a little prior progress on that front, and it was revenue neutral for education because the state would reimburse the counties for the money they lost from the property taxes these poor people paid. But if the state doesn't have money, or if the state is busy giving these huge tax cuts, then it does create a conflict between the counties and the state. And so that's, that's an ongoing conflict. And if I were there, I would still be working on that front as well. Otherwise, I'm for taxes. You know, I just, I think, I mean, I'm for paying for membership. America's a club, I believe, in belonging to, and that I 
believe we pay dues to and that we all have that obligation. And so, and not putting things off and not paying for them and saying, oh, our grandchildren will pay for them, we'll just borrow the money. I, no, I, if I were still there, I would be working along that front. And even, even with agriculture and some of these things, I just think if, if we thought more in terms of, of fairness to people who are not, not doing so well, and not and instead of just going for the top one percent or top one tenth of one percent to give all the tax relief to, we would move closer to what my idea of America always has been the promise of America. Um, and we weren't supposed to be a monarchy. We weren't supposed to have just you know the top one tenth of one percent making all the gains. So I'd be I'd be working on that front. And so you say, what's changed? <laughs> it's just that that notion that all of a sudden that we don't have to pay for anything, and that we're great and we're the best, um, even when we're not, and even when we're not paying for it, and uh, somehow seeing government as a negative. Government is is just us, just the roads we drive on, and the you know paying for fire and emergency services and all those things we take for granted. And that's what I stopped taking for granted when I lived overseas and learned a little more about how lucky we were. Because you, you see, in the Middle East, you see people who just don't have any of, many of these things we have. Well, we need a few more of you. <laughs> I doubt that, but, to, to but put in, put in I think we need, we need lots of people pushing for a progress and the common wheel. And when I feel um, more hopeful, I'll be there with them. I, I, I'm feeling, right now I'm feeling old. Oh. I'm feeling <laughs> old and... Um, I feel there's a lot of work up ahead, but I haven't crossed that bridge yet. I'll let you know. Okay. So how about you? What What do you do at OSU? You're, are you with the library officially? I'm a librarian. We moved here in 96. Um, I was a social worker before that. I switched gears at midlife and went into librarianship. My husband switched gears and went from computer science to geography. So he's a wow! He's a professor See days. that if I went back to school, that would be something I'd be interested in. And and I have known some geography teachers in the past from OSU, and that is a wonderful thing that we have here. And it started with that National Geographic Alliance, mm -hmm. and we have these teacher institutes, and and they usually meet here, or they have met here. Now I see I haven't kept up with them the last three years. I'm a little, but 96, so, you, so you've so been here for 11 years. Have, have you come to think education is um, a priority in Oklahoma or a, um, an area that needs more commitment made to it, or how do you see it? I think it needs more myself. I've got a 17-year-old, and I don't, I don't know. Coming from Tennessee, it's very similar. I think there's not a not a great deal of difference. I was went to uh, elementary school in North Carolina. Yeah. And so switching from North Carolina from the sixth grade into the seventh grade, the difference was amazing. I didn't have to study any. You know, for like Isn't three that years. interesting? See, we had that great education leadership in North Carolina for years, forty years before we ever started really thinking about it. We had Governor Hodges and. Eventually, Governor James Hunt, Jim Hunt, um, and I'm trying to think of there's one great governor in between, and I don't even know who the governor is today. <laughs> but but that they just kept building. So we went to see that research triangle in North Carolina in 1983. We did a tour, and Stratton Taylor, who eventually, you know, with, you know, was married to Carolyn, mm -hmm. uh, eventually, and he and I were in the legislature then, and we took this tour. 
we were both in the house at that time. We took this tour and saw their math science school and saw their research triangle. And um, really, it was from Governor Hunt as, as well as Earl Mitchell at OSU, professor at OSU, that I got the idea of the math science school from. Um, and it was Governor Hunt's fabulous leadership, but his leadership was built on the foundation of that historic commitment to education in North Carolina. Just amazing. And that is so interesting to hear you say that, that Tennessee and Oklahoma That's are, my perception. are more alike. And I think even in these days of education reform, they're number one in nationally certified teachers. You know, and that was an initiative of Jim Hunt's when he was in the U.S. Senate. But also as governor is an initiative of his. And it was an early childhood commitment. Was an initiative. When did you leave North Carolina? Uh, 71. Oh, well, you left before he was governor. Because mm -hmm. he was governor in the 80s. Well, we just figured it was because property taxes were always higher. If, in North Carolina. If they, they are, are then that would say something. Mm -hmm. But um, that is so interesting about Tennessee. And some of these states have really switched from being Democrat to Republican. I think that that civil rights issue really did well, Tennessee, make a right difference. Before we left, they had just started not too long before we left the, the merit system for teachers. My mother in law's a retired school teacher. And she had maxed out at that, gotten the highest she could go, and had jumped through all those hoops. So. Well, see, that's what our state has the ceiling. I mean, you get up to the top, and then you may still teach for 10 or 15 more years, but nothing changes. Mm -hmm. You can't. It's until we created this um, National Board Certified, there wasn't any way for those experienced teachers to gain more. And I would love to see us have, have a bonus for teaching in, in the uh, lower performing schools and helping those kids. Well, I think there may be some great inflation going on too in some, yes. some places. I, I, I get that impression just from several things. but Yeah, and so then... Well, they don't do as well in college once they get there. And the, and the colleges can tell us something. We don't have enough um, sharing and cooperation between higher ed and common ed. We need more between the superintendent's office and the regent's office mm -hmm. so that it's more of a seamless system, quote unquote. That's what one of those things we worked for to make 1017 more of a seamless effort. But we never got there. So, under unfinished business, that's something else so that um, there's more um, transparency at the common ed level so we can get extra help to the students who need it mm -hmm. to get to college, and then colleges get better prepared students. Well, at least now they have the right to try. Well, now that is it. something. That, that is, um, and that is for high school students, mm -hmm. and what, what does it add to the high school curriculum? I don't know if it adds to the curriculum, but in the you can take a class in the summer at a college, and if you make a good enough grade, you can get into college. If okay. Your, if your GPA or your yes. ACT score wasn't high enough to get you there before. Before. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is so. That is an improvement. What we had before was um, concurrent enrollment. So this is an improvement even beyond concurrent it's enrollment. It's an other option, I guess. Concurrent's still going on. Yeah. No, but this is an add-on. This is good. Okay. I, when it came, but I think it's very. I think it was very recent. And, and I think that was a regents initiated mm -hmm. change. And they have, I will say, ever since we did that independent higher ed study and we got a new chancellor, Higher Ed has been doing a lot more. Um, and that was under Henry Bellman that we got two regents who were leaders. And then we got a majority of five who were leaders. That may have been one of his most important contributions as governor, was to appoint those good regents. They're almost ready. I need to thank you for coming today. It was very, very <laughs> nice having you here.